Hello everybody! In this video I'm going to talk about my first binder. In this binder you are going to see white, green and blue cards. And this is the first of the three videos in which I'm going to showcase my collection of 93 and 94 Old School Magic cards in which you are going to see 100% of those cards printed from Alpha to Fallen Empires, of course with some reprints, but still they are definitely playable in Old School Magic. I tried to do my best to make it a top-down perspective video. It's still not exactly top-down, but you can definitely see everything. It is a 4K video, so you can zoom in if you are on mobile. If you have a large screen, I'm definitely sure that you will be able to see all of the smaller text if you switch to the 4K resolution. So without any further ado, let us take a look at all of those cards that we see here. And uh, it's definitely not a uh, fast video in which I'm just browsing through the binder, but I'm also going to talk about some of these cards and I'm not going to bore you with the stories of how I got here. I may want to make an additional video on that. So this particular video is all about the cards rather than about my collection per se. So uh, here we're going to see, as you can see, the cards that are arranged and uh, this definitely did take me a long time to do. They are arranged number one by mana cost and number two alphabetically. So as for the colors, the arrangement is the following. It goes with white, green and blue, which we are going to see in this binder. Then we have got red and black in the second binder. Then multicolored cards, then artifacts. And the third binder is going to be dedicated to lands. First non-basic lands and then all of the basics that I have got. So uh, here, as you can see, we do get some reprints. I tried to put the English language cards first, if we have that. So for example, if we take a look at Abu Jafar, I'm not entirely sure if that's the case for Abu. Yeah, it's the case for Abu. So as you can see here, we've got the English Chronicles first, and then even though this black bordered Abu Ja. Paru, I guess. The Japanese one, even though it looks cool, uh, it's still the second card here because it's all about alphabetizing the cards, so that's why I wanted to have the English name first. And uh, uh, here on this page, as you can see, uh, there is a camel. Actually, there are a couple of camels. Uh, with camel, there is a very interesting story how I almost got killed by a blessed camel. And uh, I was playing Brothers of Fire EDH, so to say, and uh, it was definitely very interesting. So, Camel is a nice creature, uh, which is pretty much useless, even though it does have bending, but yes, deserts are not that relevant, to be honest with you. And next, uh, we have got Animate Wall, which is definitely an interesting card to talk about. But the problem with Animate Wall is that it is an aura in modern terms, so to say. That's why it's definitely going to be very easy to destroy the wall on which this card is attached, to which it is attached. And uh, sadly, we don't have cards like Rolling Stones, for example from the late editions where you would be able to animate all of the walls. Still, I'm not abandoning the idea of making a nice and uh, interesting deck based on walls. Uh, next, uh, we have got Blaze of Glory. Blaze of Glory is an interesting card as well. Of course, it is a combat trick that can be used for some interesting interactions. But uh, more importantly, it can even be used on your opponent's card, which not something I have seen people do, but actually it is something that's possible. So technically you can use it as a nice combo trick. Of course you can use it on your, even a Jafar, you can use it on Cockatrice uh, or on some other creatures with some beneficial effects. So definitely an interesting thing, a blaze of glory. Uh, we have also got a couple of words here which are pretty useless, brainwash is nothing to talk about here and yeah we also do have one word here next on this page we do have a lot of beautiful and uh, pretty much useless things 
and uh, we've got the glyph, we've got a square, I'm sorry, not a square, equinox, what am I talking about, the square is going to be in the next page actually, a couple of next pages, and uh, so there we have got some rather obscure things, not really anything to talk about, um, there is one interesting card, uh, that is a kind of a surprise card, surprise card, and um, it is a combo breaker. And what do I mean by this? You remember the white ward cards that we have just taken a look at, such as red ward and uh, green ward over here, for instance. So this is death ward, which is, I guess, by itself a pun. It is not an enchantment, it is an instant. It also costs one white mana, but it instead regenerates target creature. I will talk about these combo breakers because there are a couple of series, even within old school magic, of cards uh, like that. Uh, then we have got an interesting one, and I absolutely love the art over here. It's super mysterious. It's uh, somehow reminiscent of those early fantasy games. Some computer RPGs, Clergy of the Holy Nimbus. And uh, I have seen this card in play. I don't think I have ever played it myself. At least in the decks that I actually constructed in paper. But still. So, uh, next, uh, going to this page, we will see Healing Solve. So this is one of the Alpha cards. I do have a fair share of Alpha cards, I guess somewhere around a dozen of them, and uh, we will be looking at those cards, but um, it's not always that I was able to get them, and uh, usually if I did get them, these would be the cards that I value quite a lot, and uh, in which I have got some interest. Next, let's take a look at some Fallen Empires. So Fallen Empires at first, before Atlantic uh, Old School Magic was a thing, I didn't even put Fallen Empires cards into my general collection. You know, I had a special place for them, which was at the last pages of my colors and uh, different categories of cards. But uh, then I uh, actually found that it is guessing more popularity because I didn't play much Eternal Central. Most people are playing Swedish and still I probably play more Swedish than Atlantic today, but Fallen Empires is not something that is uh, definitely not old school magic that you know feels out of place. So now I'm happy to play with Fallen Empires cards as well. It is a very misunderstood set. We will have a, a separate discussion on that. So here, as you can see, uh, sometimes you know, in the very early days of me collecting this, and it started in 2017. Some cards might even be early, but I got them for my kitchen table magic, so to say. Um, some of these earlier cards were actually difficult to get in terms of a particular picture. So you couldn't just buy a particular picture from Fallen Empires. It just said, I'm ordering one copy of a card and uh, yeah, that's it. It was a surprise as per what you're going to get in terms of pictures. But of course now things are different. We know that some arts are valued more than the others. For example, the famous wolf from uh, Fallen Empires, him to Torek Wolf is uh, usually more expensive than the others, but um, here I didn't really try my best to collect every picture, as you can see. Here I think I'm missing one of the Javelineers. Next we've got the Money Changer, so again it's uh, more of a discussion about Fallen Empires, but that's an incredibly interesting card, just in terms of what it can do, and it's such a pity that many Fallen Empires cards can be fixed by lowering the mana cost, or at least adding one point of toughness or power uh, that would make things a little bit better. Next, so we, here we have got, of course, a lot of Fallen Empires because they are all occasion something, right? And I uh, think we are going to have a different uh, discussion about them. So, as I was saying, sometimes I wasn't able to get the English version of the card. <coughs> and um, that's why I could only get the... Italian, for example, cards. So, of course, we've got Italian Legends, we've got Italian The Dark, and uh, I do like the colors over here, and uh, it's not something that really bothers me. Uh, and, of course, I would prefer to have the English copy, at least one English copy in every case, but it wasn't always possible. So, as for Red Ward, here we see quite an interesting thing uh, in terms of languages. We see the Italian copy again, then we've got 
as you can see Japanese one more Japanese and uh, that would be Chinese language so this is how it happened and uh, I did sometimes try to get blackboarded foreign blackboarded cards if I could so about the number of cards my rationale was the following I would normally try to get a play set of the cards if they're playable if they are somewhat important and not too expensive in terms of money so definitely you will see a play set of swords to plowshares you will see a play set of uh, seven lines for sure you will see a play set of some cards that are not necessarily going to be important but i thought that i could make them work so for example we will see a play set of no, we are not going to say play set of remove enchantments, and I thought it was the case. I still don't have the inventory, to be honest with you, so it was a real pain to alphabetize every card. I just went to Scryfall, and uh, I looked at every card that I was missing, or perhaps I was not missing them, but, you know, after you go to, for example, Card Kingdom, so most of my cards I got from Card Kingdom, previously it was Troll and Toad, Star City Games a little bit, and um, ABU games, actually quite a lot of those cards. Uh, some of them were based on the um, trade that I made. So I did buy list some of my, for example, legacy and modern cards. And uh, I definitely do not regret it at all. And I traded uh, a good chunk of my collection for old school, which I'm really happy about. But uh, then again, this is exactly how it happened. And, uh, you know, I wasn't really uh, thinking that I would get uh, every card, but very often when I looked at the list, I then thought that, yes, I do have this card, but then I found that I don't. So it was only last year that I audited my whole collection, and um, very early in the last year I got some of my final cards. And um, if you look back at this channel, you will actually see a video in which uh, I'm talking about, you know, my last mail day. And it was true because after that I didn't order any cards uh, by mail, but I found that I was missing uh, Sunglasses of Urza. And it was a very interesting story because Sunglasses of Urza is the card that I had ordered three times. Three times I ordered Sunglasses of Urza and every time I didn't get it. So the first occasion was where I got it from ABU Games and uh, they didn't mail it to me because they were out of stock. The second time was when I ordered it and uh, then this package got, uh, basically it was sent back uh, on its way to me, so I didn't get it either. And uh, Card Kingdom, uh, or was it ABU Games? Yeah, it was ABU Games. They actually compensated me for that. And uh, finally, finally, I found a copy of Sunglasses of Furza in my local store, and um, it was a bit overpriced, even though it was one of the later editions, and I think it was the fourth edition, and uh, they agreed to sell it to me for somewhere around one dollar. But in the end, I still didn't get it because they were also out of stock even there. So finally, finally, then I found one card locally, from a player of a magical collector of magic over here and uh, he was kind enough to sell it to me the beta copy uh, at a decent price and uh, this was really my last card that I was missing uh, but then again I didn't really cheat because it was not the mail day so to say and uh, that's the idea so here we have got um, I think this is a beta copy, if I'm not mistaken. It is a beta copy of uh, Circle Protection Red. Yep. So, one easy way to tell. You know, even at a distance, I'm looking at this uh, through the viewfinder, and it's actually very, very far from here. I am very far from those cards. And, uh, yeah, if we put them like this, and uh, we see that they're matching in terms of the shape, then... It is a beta. So, yeah, I, I love the colors here. Very interesting situation we've got, as you can see. So, there's a super washed out copy from uh, 
revised and I actually like it and uh, much much more saturated copies from earlier editions so yeah I actually promised in the tra trailer announcement so to say in the announcement of this uh, video to talk about this card so visions and um, there was always a card that intrigued me and uh, I don't know why it doesn't get enough love um, maybe it's seen as a kind of a filler but um, looking at the top five cards and the choosing to shuffle it, it seems quite good to me you know um, maybe in combination with the Sylvan library it can be nice we don't have enough shuffle effects I'm uh, thinking of a deck which is basically a <coughs> sorry a top deck control with the uh, field of dreams so can be a good idea nevertheless uh, here one of the cards that I really love is Island Sanctuary talking about the picture absolutely amazing and uh, there is the castle in the distance as you can see I'm not sure if you noticed it but this is the sanctuary per se and uh, one more card we should discuss which I almost missed is balance so as you can see I talked about getting a playset of course if we're talking about restricted cards there is no need to get a playset only one copy would suffice but balance is such as an iconic card it's really a super powerful card and uh, I thought why not get a black bordered version as well and the same can be said about mind twist which I also later upgraded uh, here, so Squire that we wanted to talk about. So as you can see, if we talk about useless cards, I usually get only one or two copies. Uh, but who knows? You might need them. You might need them one day. And uh, that's the thing. Next, uh, we have some very nostalgic card. You know, when I look at some of these cards, I always remember how I played the Chandelar game, which I'm absolutely sure many of you are familiar with, or maybe you did play this game, or maybe it even started the old school magic nostalgia for you, uh, as it was the case for me, because I started playing magic in uh, 2000, the paper magic, so to say, and uh, this was when Prophecy came out, but before that, from uh, 97, I was playing the computer game and uh, of course, there we had all of those earlier sets, expansions. It was definitely the game made by enthusiasts for gamers. It made it was made by people who really love the game. And uh, they did, of course, pursue money in some way because, well, it was, of course, a commercial enterprise. But it was not greedy. You know, they really gave us the best product that they could probably make at that time. And uh, everybody was happy. That's why we still love this game. And... There are still different mods for that. Uh, the people are still playing this game on streams and so on. It was not forgotten. Uh, next we have got Samite Healer. And uh, this is one of those cards again that uh, brings back some very nice vibes of uh, the Chandelar game. I remember it very well. And uh, here, the next picture... We have to talk, of course, about the obvious. As you can see, I have got all of those seven band cards. I see no reason to remove them from the binder. And uh, in uh, Old School Magic, actually, in case you don't know about it, uh, these cards are still actually legal. It does depend on the play group, but uh, it's definitely not something that uh, people will you know, frown upon in case you are playing these cards, because, well... I think I don't have to explain to you how exactly it is um, supposed to work. So next we have got Blessing. And uh, Blessing is a very interesting one because if you look here, it looks so random, right? So white, 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 plus one, plus one. Who gets plus one, plus one? When does it happen? When does it end? Uh, it's crazy. I absolutely love this wording. Well, if we can talk about wording at all. 
So having absolutely no words is really powerful here. So speaking of uh, those cards, we can take a look at again four Fallen Empires cards. And again, I've got the three different arts over here. This is my favorite one, Order of Lightbur. I don't know why exactly I like it so much, but it's probably the colors, really colorful and uh, quite a nice thing. There are some absolutely crazy effects. I really would like to make this card somewhat broken. I really would like to see it uh, being abused in some interesting way. But I'm not sure it's even possible. I don't know. Maybe some small weenie deck. And then you will sacrifice all of your creatures. And draw a ton of cards. But I don't think it's happening. So that's why I've never seen this card uh, being in play. Then we have got Shahrazad. So Shahrazad is the card that I was a bit reluctant to get because... It is expensive, it's not something I have played, and I'm pretty much sure I'm never going to play it, because it is an interesting card, but I'm not entirely convinced about its efficiency, and even for the spice effect, no, not something I will play. But, of course, the art is gorgeous, the card is iconic. This was, as you know very well, one of the first banned cards, and uh, it's absolutely crazy. How it works so about the condition of these cards as you can see some of them are not in a great condition and uh, sometimes we can see some pretty bad surface damage some dirt and uh, these are you know extreme cases uh, I think it happened only once so I got these cards as heavily played copies from ABU games and uh, you can see a video where I actually get them and I'm ranting about this because it's pretty terrible, you know, it's not a heavily played card in my book, it's it's even worse. But most of them, most of them I would get in near mint condition, especially the cards that are not super expensive. Even some of the more expensive cards I also did get in that uh, near mint condition. Some of them were excellent, some of them were good. Again, if we talk about the grading made by Card Kingdom. So, there are some fun cards that I got in uh, two copies. So, the Archaeologist is one of those. And if we move on, we are going to see some very interesting things, such as the Preacher. So, it's not the right way, actually. The English cards should be here. So, a good way for us to compare the English legends and those saturated Italian legends. So a playset of preachers, not bad, right? And uh, there are some cards that I would like to have more of, but I'm definitely not expanding my collection now. Uh, here we can see Thunder Spirit, which I always thought was overpriced in terms of money. But um, first strike and flying for three mana, it's really nice. I've seen this card in action. I really like it. Next, we've got something rather obscure. We've got this card. This is Infinite Authority, if I'm not mistaken in English. Uh, the name is. And uh, here you can see a ton of text and uh, it's a little bit misleading, but overall, overall, the effect is somewhat convoluted. It's uh, three mana. I'm definitely not playing it. Haven't tried it, but I don't know. It could be an interesting thing to try. Next, we've got Farmstead. And this is such a great card. Uh, such an amazing picture over here. And when you look at it, you really can just teleport there. You're just looking there and you're thinking about the kind of weather that they have there. It's uh, quite warm, not too hot. Uh, you see those chicken over there, you see this hut, and uh, you can even feel the smell, you can feel the sun shining, and uh, I don't know, it's such an amazing thing, because these cards are not that big, they, these cards are really 
uh, I would say tiny, but the pictures over there, if you look at them very carefully, you can definitely feel all of the magic, you can feel the atmosphere over there. And uh, I think that this actually does contribute to the whole popularity of magic and the magic art, because magic art uh, definitely is getting a lot of recognition now, and this is great, especially old school magic cards. Um, the thing is that if you think about it, when you play magic, if you play old school magic, for example, you're going to be seeing those cards, you're going to be looking at those pictures for a very long time. And uh, to be honest with you, if we talk about some famous pictures, so I can definitely tell you that if I look at, let's say, Sarah Angel, right? An iconic card. Uh, I have played it dozens of times in my different decks. And uh, when I simply had this card in my hand and was looking at it, I definitely saw it, I spent more time, so to say, looking at this card than, for example, Mona Lisa or some other incredibly famous picture, incredibly famous painting. So that's something to think about. Maybe we have such strong attachment to those cards just because of the time that we spent looking at them when playing. It's quite an interesting idea, isn't it? So, since we started talking about Sarah Angel, of course it's worth mentioning that here we have got this great uh, misprint and uh, again I wouldn't even call it a misprint because there is no copy of uh, Spanish Sarah Angel yes and uh, or is there I actually forgot which one it is uh, because it's actually quite convoluted it actually is quite convoluted because now that we play this card we treat it as Sarah Angel but in all actuality, I think in Spanish there was no time elemental printed. So in all actuality, actually it is time elemental rather than Ser Angel. I need to check that, but I think that's the thing. That's the case with this card. So yeah, a great one. I got it when I was traveling to Spain and I had a conference there. And uh, instead of going on a trip in Valencia with other conference participants. I just went to Madrid and they met my good friend Manuel there uh, with whom we met playing uh, Old School Magic and uh, we did have a blast playing in real life and uh, I just want to say that the community of Old School Magic is so good and it's incredibly welcoming and uh, it's a real pleasure to meet people with whom you are playing online on webcam and uh, then I did get this glorious uh, Sarah Elemental, so to say, misprint. The Avengers. Quite an interesting card, isn't it? So, Planeswalk. The only card that has Planeswalk in Old School Magic. And there is even a special card that prevents people... I'm sorry, prevents creatures from using Planeswalk. Uh, it's crazy, really. Uh, one more card that I also wanted to focus on is this one. So, the Sanctuary by none other than Amy Weber. Amy Weber has incredibly mysterious cards. Um, she's very, very good with light. As you can see here, we can see what kind of uh, lighting there is in this picture. It's amazing. And uh, I remember very well, like in uh, the year 2000, I still... Cannot say that I had proper internet. I had dial-up back then. So this doesn't really count as proper internet. It was super slow. And uh, there were many people living in the house. It's not that I was able to use the internet all the time, especially that dial-up. And uh, one of the things that I noticed about the Chandelar game is that the decks contained IDs of the cards. So you would go to the text file and uh, you will be able to see what kind of cards there were, and you could manually edit it in Notepad. You could edit the cards that were contained in the deck. And what's interesting is that the list uh, went on after the cards that were actually in game. So you could input some random number that was higher than the idea of the very last card that you could find in the deck editor. And then you would sometimes see those cards actually in the deck. 
And it's very interesting because they had initially planned to include a lot of different cards. So it's important to say that I think um, the Chandelier game includes originally somewhere around a half or maybe even one third of all of the cards. Uh, I'm talking about um, Legends, Antiquities, Arabian Nights specifically. It doesn't have each of the cards. So I specifically remember that this was the card that was not in the game and obviously there is nothing really special about it. It's not that we really want to have this card in the game. It doesn't really have that much value. But the interesting thing is that I saw it and I was absolutely mesmerized by the fact that I could actually find a new card in that particular uh, program and uh, you know I was really really obsessed with that I just made some random lists of cards and uh, I was just looking at them enjoying the pictures and of course I had an obsession with that I tried to make it work because when you would start a game of course you wouldn't be able to use this card in the game uh, because I think there was just a hard limit if the cards ID was I don't know in this uh, so to say, list of cards that weren't supported, you wouldn't be able to play, but I didn't understand it back then. Probably uh, these cards weren't programmed, uh, they just contained the images, but no game logic associated with them. But nevertheless, quite an interesting story. I just want to emphasize how important the art was to me, and still is, of course, and uh, how impressive all of these things are. And one more interesting card also was banned, and, uh, <laughs> you know, is just amazing because no game should end in a draw or at least no match should end in a draw especially so one of those final matches so let's proceed to green now as for green it is a color that um, doesn't get that much attention in old school magic some people of course are playing mono green some people are trying to uh, build some crazy and funny things i have seen the ailing leprechaun deck uh, sadly, haven't played it myself, and uh, Quinton Hoover art, as you know, is uh, absolutely something else. You can instantly recognize his style if you look at the cards. But um, still, uh, very frequently, green is just about uh, Sylvan Library, Regrowth, maybe Birds of Paradise, maybe Berserk as well. So, Berserk, I finally did get a playset of and uh, here I usually tried to put the card on top which is not a collector's edition card if I could because I don't really like those uh, square corners at the very front but uh, sometimes it wasn't the case so drop of honey drop of honey is an interesting card it was a um, buyout target I think in one of the earliest days of uh, magic finance the new wave, I mean, starting probably in 2017, 2018. And, uh, yeah, I managed to get this card locally. It's quite a nice copy with the authentic signature by Anson Maddox. I'm not chasing signed cards, and if I do have a signed card very frequently, it is just because I didn't have any other choice. I do know that they somehow increase the value of some cards, but, um, I mean, for some people... And, uh, of course, if the artist is no longer able to sign a card or if the signature is very difficult to get, it's going to get you a premium, but I didn't really chase that, as I have said. And um, that's why you're only going to see a handful of those. Next, we have got another card I wanted to look at, just to talk about the art. So, Mark Poole. Mark Poole. Um, I know that there are a lot of fans of Mark Poole, I'm one of them. I remember very clearly that Mark Poole was the first artist whose art I started to notice. You know, I saw, of course, the illustration credits on every card, but very frequently I didn't pay attention to that. But then I started to see that here's a card I like, here's Ancestral Recall that I like, uh, here is, for example, another card I like, here's the third card. And then I see it, look, it's Mark Poole, it's Mark Poole, it's Mark Poole. And now I uh, definitely see that Mark Poole is my favorite artist of Old School Magic, so just by default, if you ask me who is your favorite artist of Old School Magic, no questions asked, Mark Poole. But of course it doesn't mean that this is the only artist whose art I enjoy, but he was definitely the first artist that um, captured me with his colors, with his uh, magical themes, 
uh, it really embodies the magic in a very good way. I'm not sure how to explain it properly, but this is definitely something that I highly appreciate. Uh, this doesn't, of course, mean that I don't like the other artists. Now, I can certainly say that there is no artist in uh, Old School Magic whose art I dislike. I, I absolutely love all of these. Um, some of this came a little bit later to me. So, for example, if we talk about Anson Maddox, I like art by Anson Maddox. I didn't necessarily identify his style at first. Now, of course, I'm able to see it and... Uh, uh, th there are some artists uh, who I got to appreciate only much later. Now, for instance, I absolutely love uh, this girl, this um, Elves of Deep Shadow uh, girl uh, by Jasper Murphers. I know it's a favorite card uh, for many people, and uh, just the way that it looks, this uh, highly realistic uh, image, actually, if you look at it, it really does look like a photo, and... Uh, the whole lighting here, the shadows, it's absolutely amazing. You definitely gotta love this. But I didn't really necessarily look at it in the past. Um, I, I, I cannot say that I appreciated it back then as I do now. And uh, yeah, there are some very obscure cards which are expensive, but you cannot explain why. So one of those cards is natural selection. And uh, it's a crazily difficult to get card. At least it was when I was building up my collection. So there is no good explanation for that, except for, I don't know, somebody has this very weird affection for those, uh, I don't know, eagle, tiger people. I'm not sure how it works, but it's a crazy card. And I do have a playset. Look, I do have a playset. Why? Well, because I wanted to manipulate the library, of course. I really wanted to manipulate the library, rearrange the cards or shuffle the library, look. So, quite an interesting thing. And uh, next, talking about again hand control or um, library control, we've got Revelation. I really regret not getting the blackboarded copy because it would look much better here. But it is what it is. And uh, this stained glass. Can you see this nowadays? Definitely not. And uh, looking at the artist, actually, uh, Kaya or Ke Kaija, I'm sorry if I don't pronounce this correctly, but um, she actually has a, a variety of styles. And uh, this is not her, so to say, most uh, popular style, not the default style. So it's interesting that there are some cards that I never, never see anybody play. And one of those cards is Living Artifact, but definitely does bring memories. Um, it's Anson Maddox. It's uh, somewhat gross, I don't know what it is, an artifact that became a heart or something, and uh, it's a pretty useless form of life gain, but yeah, I do remember this card from back in the day. Next, um, we have got uh, some, what can we focus on? For example, we can focus on the wolves. So, this card, surprisingly, is a rare it really is a rare, you know. Benelish Hero is just a common, but this one is a rare. And uh, I did get the playset, of course. I wanted to say that in Old School Magic, there are 900-something cards, 980-something. It actually depends on how you count and uh, whether you include the now-banned cards or not. Uh, that are banned in other formats, but not in old school. But the thing is that uh, maybe somewhere around one-fifth of the cards are actually considered to be playable. You will find them in tournament decks. But a uh, whole other cards also deserve our attention. One of those cards, I would say, is Winter Blast. So just look at this card. Just look at how beautiful it is. It really is something from the fairy tale, some Snow Queen. And uh, you can feel the chill over here. It's uh, it's just so beautiful. I don't know. I really, really love it. It is an amazing card, if you look at it. But it doesn't see much love. Definitely not. So, next, we are going to turn the page and um, look at some other cards. So, of course, there is Sylvan Library. Sylvan Library, I've got... Three copies of and I was thinking of getting the fourth but 
then I look at different deck lists, I see that people never play a play set of uh, Sylvan Libraries, or if they do, they do incredibly rarely. And uh, actually, this is the Cthulhu library, if you understand. And uh, I don't think that this is coincidental. I love the art here. Of course, black bordered copies are always better looking. Not always, I would say, a couple of exceptions. Especially, especially if we talk about some white cards um, in which border uh, works very well with the frame. So uh, what I'm referring to is, uh, for example, you know, some artists really, really did make minimalistic art, which I absolutely love. And if you look at Life Force, you see it blends so well together with the frame. So the green picture blends very well with the green frame. And this is something I highly appreciate about such cards. And um, actually, we can even talk about channel. So channel, I have a couple of copies of. And of course, I'm dreaming of making a channel fireball deck, but I haven't ever done that. And here, I don't like the picture at all. I don't know. It does look painful. Probably this is the original intention. And... Uh, I don't know, just not a picture I like to look at. Uh, unlike, for example, Emerald Dragonfly by Quentin Hoover again. Quentin Hoover is the absolute master of uh, working with color, creating uh, some kind of maybe, I'm not sure if we can call this stained glass aesthetics, but uh, he's the absolute master. And uh, his art I only got to appreciate much later. I understood uh, what a genius he is. How he was able to paint his cards. Next, we have got quite an interesting thing over here that is uh, Ice Storm, altered by the artist. So you can even see this Typex, Typex, what, how do we even pronounce that? And uh, this is uh, done by Dan Fraser himself, the artist. Uh, he's incredibly creative with his altars. This is a signed card. And uh, here he basically did what we only later saw in Unglued, right? We see the uh, fourth wall being broken. And uh, we see that uh, there is some snow on the, on the card. It even goes out on, gets out of the borders. I absolutely love it. It's so beautiful. Such an amazing copy. Really my favorite altar that I have got. And um, uh, he actually made quite a lot of these. I also have got uh, Goblin Bomb, which we are going to see in the next video. And uh, uh, I wanted, really wanted to buy a Ring of Maruf, but... Unfortunately, couldn't do that. And Ring of Maruf had some very beautiful wind, some kind of smoke around this ring. Uh, so, walls. I actually absolutely love walls. The original walls by Richard Thomas. All of them contain a mage behind the wall. Sometimes the mage is easier to see, sometimes much more difficult. So, I will, make actually, I will actually make a redux of the video uh, that I previously released on this channel. And uh, I will talk about all of the walls in Old School Magic, and uh, they're definitely worthy of some attention. So as you can see uh, here, this is not the wall by Richard Thomas, this is by Anson Maddox, and uh, here we do not see the mage. And um, walls definitely don't get enough love, but it is what it is. Uh, here we have got this card, uh, Power Lich. I was sometimes reluctant to get some of those cards. You know, the psychological barrier for me was somewhere around $10, I would say. So if a card is less than $10, I would get it without any thoughts. I would just get it to have it in my collection. To, if it was more expensive, when I didn't set the goal of collecting every single 93-94 uh, Magic card, I would be a bit reluctant because, well, it's unplayable. Why would I have it? But, you know, I, I think that there is no stopping once you really start, start collecting a Magic. Uh, at least this is how it works for me. Uh, next, I wanted to look at some of the creepier cards. And this guy still creeps me out. Not as much as the Fallen uh, that I, as you will see, altered actually even to make them less scary. But 
yeah, he is creepy, all right. But the effect is actually very nice. It's a ton of green mana. So triple green mana, quadruple green mana to regenerate. Definitely overcosted, but the ability to regenerate every creature that you have actually is worth quite a lot. So it's not a bad card, trust me. Sometimes it's good to go back to the days of um, playing Chandelar and, uh, you know, remembering some of those early combos. And sometimes you really felt like some kind of a genius where you hadn't read anything on the internet, but you knew that it would be a good idea to lure your cockatrice, for example, or Thicket Basilisk, and uh, you felt like you were breaking the game. So this is what I absolutely like about magic. In some ways, magic is like programming, and I'm sure that you thought about it, because I even read one interesting idea that magic is actually a computer game in the form of a card game. Does that make sense? If you think about it more, then you will actually understand. Uh, the algorithms are very well defined. Uh, there are rules for everything. And um, currently, the whole system is so well organized that there are countless possibilities. There are some exploits. There are some things that don't necessarily work as you would expect them to. But uh, it is a part of the beauty of the game. So, here... Uh, we can take a look at some of the more expensive cards, as I promised, and one of those cards is Eureka. And uh, again, we see a brilliant example of the art blending in with the frame, and uh, it's really magical. Absolutely love it. Such a beautiful thing. Another card I wanted to talk about is this. The worst creature in the history of magic, as many people say. Um, it's so bad it's good. <laughs> this can certainly be said about Wood Elemental, to whom you have to sacrifice a certain number of forests, and uh, they will constitute his power and toughness. And the forests must be untapped, in addition to all of those bad things that you already know about this card. Absolutely crazy, isn't it? Next, so I wanted also to discuss one interesting thing, talking about the errata, talking about how cards changed the original meaning and uh, sometimes got back to it. So here, as you can see, I have a playset of Fungazors, and uh, Fungazor is a card that has a unique ability, so it can grow after it's damaged. And uh, as you can see here, in the original text, which is from Beta, I just would like to remind you that Collector's Edition is a full reprint of Beta, in terms of the text here, it says each time he is damaged but not destroyed, put a plus one plus one counter on it. And later on, they changed it to put a plus one plus one counter on it at the end of the turn in which it was damaged, which, as you understand, is much worse. But uh, with Pestilence, for example, you are able to grow your Funkus Ward. So here I decided specifically to get the cards uh, with the text that I am going to use. Next, we can look at some of these obscure cards for uh, two colorless and uh, two green. I don't know why there are so many of these. Uh, there is Eureka, there is Arborea, which is a really game-changing card, but not strong enough for people to play. There is the If Bifafrit. By the way, let's talk about the If Bifafrit for a second. If we look here, we will see that there is this dark Ifrit in the background. And uh, we see the bottle. It's not even in the background, I'm sorry. It's uh, basically just coming out of the, of the bottle. And uh, you can watch my video where I talk about things we may not have noticed. And uh, actually, Espermorphus himself confirmed some interesting theories. And the same thing about Ernam Jin. So which of these guys is actually the Ernam Jin? This is what you will be able to see if you watch uh, one of those videos. Next... Uh, Let's admire this beautiful copy of the Fairy Queen. And uh, it's, it's an absolute beauty. Everything is great about it. The colors, the artifacts, the background, the overall richness of this picture. It is, it is beyond any words. It is beyond what I can describe. And uh, here is a rather obscure card. 
there is this Willow Satyr that is only 1-1 one, one for 4 mana, which is terrible. And uh, he can still target Legend. Sadly, Legends didn't get much traction in Old School Magic. Uh, sadly, there are no really powerful magic. There is Gwendolyn, for example. There are the Elder Dragons. Um, there are, for example, Rasputin. Um, there are some cards that people like to use, but again, for the spice reasons, it's not that it is a popular thing to use, which is a bit of a pity. I think it's also worth looking at uh, Crow Worm. Crow Worm is the Timmy card for many players. If you ask somebody, uh, I'm absolutely sure that there's a young player in the Timmy phase, which many people haven't overgrown yet, myself included, to be honest with you. And you like to play with it. 6-4 for 6 mana, no drawbacks. Quite a good thing. So, talking about Desert Twister, I just want to say that since, of course, English is not my first language, it was not very easy to understand the cards. I think I was 11 back then when I started playing Chandelar game. And uh, here they said, destroy target permanent. So what is permanent? I had no idea. And if it said, for example, destroy any card in play like here, yeah, that would be understandable. But what is a permanent? Uh, had no idea. And uh, it's important to say that those cards were printed in the fourth edition wording in the Chandelar game, not printed, but they were included in that wording. So I had no idea what that actually meant. And uh, over here we have got Gaius Liege. This man with this elk horns. I'm not sure if it's the correct way to say that, but I like the, the card and uh, if you're playing a game of attrition, sometimes you can get to some very interesting board states and uh, you can turn a lot of your opponent's lands into forests. And uh, here we have got Crow Giant who has Rampage. So Rampage is one of those forgotten abilities. We have two uh, forgotten abilities. One of them is not that obscure because a lot of people talk about bending. Bending is actually used and um, it has some of its fans and uh, if you know how to work with it if you use the synergy of bending with some other effects it can definitely be done to your advantage and uh, here by the way i almost forgot to mention our friend Thelonious monk and uh, don't tell me that it is a coincidence right i'm talking about the jazz musician it cannot be a coincidence there are some nice things about the names you know, which are references to current time musicians, for example. So you've got Iron Maiden, you've got Rolling Stones, you've got Thelonious Monk, and I think there are some other examples. You've got Need for Speed, for example. It's a reference to the game. Again, it's not really a game. I do understand that it is a kind of an idiomatic expression, but still. So let's move to the most beloved color of magic for many players, myself included. I'm not going to lie. And this is blue. So, blue is, of course, the color that can do absolutely everything in Old School Magic. Most importantly, it can draw cards, it can take extra turns, it can deal direct damage, it can steal permanence, it can counter things, it has some powerful creatures without drawback, it has some evasion. Again, it's very difficult to say what blue cannot do. And uh, probably, if we really want to answer this question, we can say that blue cannot really deal with permanence that well, except for creatures, I guess. But removing an enchantment, for example, would be a bit more difficult. But still, there are even artifacts. You don't even have to splash another color. You can easily just play Chaos Orb or Nevilleros Disc. So that's how it can work. And uh, here I wanted to talk about some beautiful cards that we can see. So there is High Tide. High Tide, sadly, is not a card that you can see in uh, old school decks, but uh, it is a very powerful card in some further formats. And uh, I just love looking at this. I did talk about this card previously, this particular art by Amy Weber, and uh, it's so magical because look, if you look at it, there is really nothing wrong about it in terms of perspective, but 
If you start looking closer, you will understand that um, the water here and uh, the sea inhabitants, so to say, right, or ocean inhabitants, as we can say, um, that they are not in the correct position, so so to say. So what I'm trying to say here is that, of course, um, this part is a little bit more flat. I don't know, it's a little bit zoomed in, maybe. See, there's an octopus uh, of this interesting fish, and here the flying fish. And I don't know, it's amazing. Of course it's done on purpose. Amy Weber is an incredibly talented artist, and uh, I always like looking at this card. Not to say that the others are less interesting, because... For example, uh, this card by Drew Tucker. So Drew Tucker is one of those artists that I told you about that I really got to appreciate his art much later. Of course, as a preteen, I couldn't really see what was good about this uh, symbolic, uh, sometimes impressionist art, but uh, I could definitely see what was good about some more traditional, more fairy tales art. And uh, Ensign Maddox art is also nice, so... I don't know. It's it's great to have this variety. That's all I wanted to say. Uh, here you will see some memorabilia cards, and uh, this is the one that I got. Actually, discussed it with you. Uh, I think there is still the video where I talk about this. Uh, so this is the third slash fourth place uh, in 2019. I played a very nice uh, local event in which uh, I was playing blue, red, and black legends deck. And uh, this is what I got. I also got a really cool cup as well for this third place. Force Spike, unfortunately, is not a card I have played. Um, I did play it back then, but now I see that there are probably too many um, fast mana sources. Uh, people usually have a lot of Moxon. They usually have a lot of other stuff, and uh, it's just so difficult to... Make sure that your opponent has zero mana, and uh, the mana curve usually is just very good in the card in the different decks. Here, it's uh, really one of my favorites, and uh, as you can see, I even have three copies, three copies of this absolutely useless card. Because why would you make a card blue? I don't know to then counter it using Red Elemental Blast. Not likely. Would you target a creature? and uh, destroy it with the Spinal Villain? I don't think so, but just an amazing piece of art to have. So about this card, you probably know the story, and uh, the story itself is quite unusual, because what card is it from? I mean, what expansion is it from? What edition? We don't see anything, so we can assume that it is beta, but, of course, it's not beta. It was printed in Antiquities, but the only card that exists is without the expansion symbol. So, that's a little bit of trivia for you, in case you didn't know about it. Anyway, speaking of trivia, if you look at my channel, you will be able to see a video that I made during the COVID-19 pandemic times in 2020. And uh, I made a quiz on old school magic cards, and it was uh, quite an interesting thing, the Kahoot quiz. There were about a dozen of players playing, and um, I think we should do this again. So, if you are watching this, which is highly unlikely, write about it in the comments. I definitely think we can have um, this as a kind of a regular event, maybe every month, because there are so many things about old school magic trivia to discuss. So, here I wanted to take a look at uh, Merchant Ship with you. Merchant Ship is one of those cards that I mentioned that I was reluctant to get because it's such an expensive card, but it's so beautiful. Just look at it. It does nothing. It really does nothing because... Can you tell that it's a bad card? It has Island Home. It has zero power and it has Island Home. How bad is that? Oh, I don't even know what to say. Island Home is a really bad ability, but it was so forced on many blue cards that it's not even funny anymore. Next, uh, let's uh, look at some other cards here. Of course, the one that draws your attention, I think, is Time Walk. Cannot argue with that. It's a beautiful card. It's a beautiful effect. 
take an extra turn for just two mana. And uh, again, praising Emmy Weber's art, there is nothing more symbolic that I can see in old school magic paintings because you really look at it and you feel that you have been transported into another reality. It's scary, it's uh, eerie, it definitely feels like some place which doesn't follow any laws that you understand. It doesn't even follow all of your, you know, high fantasy rules and all of the things that you are familiar with. It's, I don't know, it's, it's even scary. If you look at it, it can be one of those things that you can see in the afterlife. I don't know. This is the feeling that it gives me. It's absolutely crazy. I love it so much. Then, uh, talking about, again, some memorable cards, I just want to talk about the card that Manuel gave me as a gift, a really nice card in uh, Spanish. And uh, then I also got the, so this is the famous alpha test, you see, the corners behind these round corners, definitely it is alpha. So I've never played this card because giving your opponent a choice is not generally a good idea, sadly. And uh, here I wanted to take a look with you at this card, this tortoise. So, you know, giant tortoise and giant turtle are different cards, guess what? Tortoise and turtle, I think if you look at um, this example, I mean, it was mentioned in the Blade Runner movie and it's quite funny but only later did I discover the difference between them and uh, this really got me in the a bit of a conundrum I would say because I initially got the giant turtle card and then I thought okay I have it and every time I scrolled I cannot tell you how many hundreds of times I have scrolled through different magic stores and uh, just looking at the cards I could get uh, sometimes, you know, I would walk home and I would be, uh, you know, thinking about why am I doing this. I had a lot of side jobs, had a lot of extra time that uh, I could have spent maybe in a more efficient way than working. But uh, I really, really um, see magic as one of the best uh, uses of my money. Uh, it's one of the investments that I really have because uh, my situation is quite specific. Um, stocks and shares, for instance, I still got quite a lot of it blocked. And I definitely know I'm never going to get it back. And uh, there are some other things. So, you know, you really have to understand my situation to, for example, judge me uh, for getting too many funds invested into magic. But... Um, yeah, as I was saying, you know, I, I was uh, looking at building some kind of wealth. Wealth, of course, is a very loud word for that. I'm not sure at how much I would value this collection. I did a little bit of maths. I guess it's somewhere around 20 or 30k, depending on um, how good of a deal I will be able to get. And it's not that much, but uh, it does constitute the largest chunk of my current assets, so to say. And uh, this idea got to me in uh, 2017, uh, maybe even 2016, you know, I was thinking I, I started to work more and more and uh, people started to value my work more. And uh, I would never refuse a kind of a side hustle and, uh, for example, working late at night in, uh, for example, on a Sunday evening and uh, going back home knowing that I would get back home and just have several hours to sleep and then wake up early on Monday morning again. But, you know, for what was the question? And one of the answers was to actually uh, be able to build a little bit of wealth and uh, invest it in different things, uh, magic being one of them. So I'm incredibly proud of getting there, to be honest with you. So here are two copies signed and somewhat altered by Douglas Schuller. And uh, here you can see some random things. So you can see the axe, 
Uh, here we can see those stalactites, stalagmites, don't remember which one it is, and some kind of an oriflame. And uh, yeah, it's a bit random, but it's still good to have. And uh, here, a very precious thing, which is the uh, gift from uh, Thomas, uh, Timmy, the sorcerer. And uh, really appreciate it, Timmy. Then we have got Serendips. So with Serendip, it's quite an interesting story. Because at first, of course, as you understand, I only got the uh, famous misprint. And this misprint does look cool, right? But the problem is that later I got the proper if Bifafrit. And then it started to rub me the wrong way. I was looking at it and I was getting some kind of an OCD. I didn't like it at all that I had cards with similar art. Uh, and I didn't know even how to explain this, but I couldn't have this uh, playset of uh, Serendip Fritz. And uh, I started to slowly phasing them out. And um, I got, uh, I think the first copy I got was this white bordered one. And uh, then I had got uh, not only Italian one, but also the French and uh, two German copies. So now I have the full, full playset of proper art. If it's, of course, not the Arabian Nights art, but I mean, not the Arabian Nights copy, but the Arabian Nights art. Uh, here, one card I absolutely love is this one. It's so symbolic, and uh, I don't know, I don't know what to say about it. Uh, it's quite an interesting one, isn't it? Right, this enchant world, uh, and um, in the Eye of Chaos, it was called, right? Mm, I don't know. You will counter the cards, the instants and sorceries, if uh, the opponent doesn't pay the necessary mana for them. So, <laughs> quite a weird thing. I've never played it, unfortunately. However, I did manage to play this, also super obscure card. So, um, one of the videos that is still kind of in the pipeline is the video on the design document by Richard Garfield. So Richard Garfield made some guidelines for uh, old school magic. And uh, I think it's not even old school magic, it's uh, alpha edition, the very first edition. And uh, you just have to appreciate how um, uh, much of a visionary he was, uh, how he was able to predict in a very good way what people would do, what people would appreciate, um, what kind of design patterns then can be so that the game will be able to develop in the future and uh, become prosperous. And uh, one of the things that he said um, was the idea of the enemy colors. Yeah, so the enemy colors should, so to say, be able to fight fire with fire. And here we have got another very good, very good illustration of that, I wanted to say. So, Volcanic Eruption. There are two very wrong things that you can see, because blue is not able to destroy lands. Blue is not able to deal mass damage, but here it does that. Why? Because it specifically fights fire with fire, which means that it is using the red methods, such as land destruction and mass damage, to fight against red. And uh, here we can see exactly the same thing with this card, where it destroys uh, all forests in play. This is just the mirror response to Tsunami card. So this was actually mentioned in the original document, and uh, please look forward to that, because there are a lot of things we will be discussing, and uh, there will definitely be some revelations for you, if you haven't seen this document. Another card I wanted to showcase is Mana Vortex. Mana Vortex, Douglas Schuller. Really beautiful card, uh, really symbolic. You know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of some early uh, PC games, uh, such as Loom, for example. And uh, early 90s PC games were really something else. Um, they, of course, feel nostalgic to me just because I was young back then. I was very impressionable. But um, this is probably one of the reasons why I love these things so much. Uh, one more card I wanted to look at, again, by my favorite Mark Poole, and 
probably it's the contrast, probably it's the combination of colors that really gets me here, that I really, really enjoy. Probably about that. And uh, one more great example of this combination of the frame and the art. So you look at it and you feel that it is one whole, it, it is the integral part of the card. The art and the frame and everything here together blends so well. It gives you this whole impression. I love it. One more great present from Timmy. And it was actually made by the Desert Twister team. Uh, Thomas commissioned this art from Nikki Platson, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, this is a great copy of a ghost ship with a treasure map. So we'll definitely get there. The last page, and uh, we're getting very close to the end of the video. If you have watched it until the end, comment please, because I will highly appreciate it. And uh, here is the Leviathan. Leviathan is amazing. It's so big, it can eat a whole tower and uh, can really eat it for breakfast. So, uh, this is my Old School Magic collection. This was the first video in the series. I thank you for watching it until the very end. Or maybe you can just, uh, maybe you could just rewind and uh, look at the different cards that you are particularly interested in. But uh, it was definitely a pleasure to talk about this collection with you. Look forward to the second video in which we are going to see red, black, artifact and multicolored cards. Thank you for watching and uh, I will see you soon. Bye.